Catherine Mansfield composed The Canary on July 7, 1922, during the terminal stage of her battle with tuberculosis. This work has predominantly been interpreted as an introspective exploration, focusing on the deteriorating condition of the author's own diseased body. Numerous literary critics have argued that the fluttering wings of the caged bird symbolically mirror the wheezing emanations from Mansfield's afflicted lungs. However, in this arguably autobiographical narrative, Mansfield transcends the mere textual transference of her physical ailments. Or the simplistic metaphorical representation of herself as the canary. The canary, which she painstakingly crafted in a fragmented manner akin to her coughing fits, exhibits her engagement with ectoecology, understood here as the interrelations within the external environment, and embodies a consciousness aligned with the core tenets of deep ecology. The short story revolves around an elderly woman who has been marginalized by society and finds solace in her pet canary. Her narrative idealizes her isolated existence and conveys a profound sense of connection with the bird. She anthropomorphizes the canary, describing it as a professional singer and a regular little actor. Using personification to highlight the unseen bonds and similarities between human and non-human species. This approach contrasts with biological science, which traditionally categorizes species based on structural and physiological differences. The protagonist of the story refrains from attempting to dominate the finch in her care, likely due to a perceived sense of equality or kinship. Despite having nominal control over the bird, she refrains from assigning it a personal name, referring to it simply as he or the canary, thus maintaining its anonymity akin to its wild counterparts. She does not belittle the bird by dismissing it as unintelligent. Rather, she engages with it as a friend, conversing with it regularly. In her reminiscence, the protagonist perceives their bond as firmly established. The canary, as if reciprocating her affectionate treatment and acknowledging their parity, gives her a sidelong glance, which can be interpreted as a sign of their mutual, tender connection. The bird gazes at her with one bright eye, rather than engaging in direct eye contact that, in the language of animals, would denote a challenge or threat. This subtle, partial gaze, imbued with an undertone of affection, signifies the emotional bond between them. Despite the canary's natural aversion to physical closeness and its fear of being touched, it communicates to its nominal owner that their relationship is rooted in emotional ties. Additionally, the bird's melodious song serves as a crucial factor in uniting them, as it encourages the woman to mentally align herself with the canary. She believes she can comprehend the essence of each note in its exquisite song, suggesting that the vocal creature, much like humans, conveys a hidden message through its harmonious sounds. By identifying with the canary, she feels she grasps the message embedded within the birdsong. Consequently, the soundscape created by the canary in their intimate world, to which she is entirely receptive, transforms into a silent, almost mystical, mode of communication between them, thereby deepening their bond. Another conduit for interspecies communication in their relationship is emotional identification, where the roles are reversed, the woman produces the sound. She laughs, then observes the canary to gauge his reaction, inferring the bird's emotional response by saying, It seemed to amuse him. This suggests that she believes the bird can comprehend laughter as an expression of happiness. Indicative of its emotional resonance with her, just as she can perceive the bird's amusement, 
reflecting her emotional connection with the canary. In these moments, the boundaries between human and animal blur, merging their emotions into a unified experience. This profound emotional intertwining becomes even more evident upon the bird's death, when she remarks, something seemed to die in me. My heart felt hollow. This locates the canary at the very core of her being, underscoring the deep symbiosis and intrinsic value of their bond. Moreover, the bird, noticeably absent, continues to occupy her thoughts, challenging the boundaries between life and death and the supposed divide between human and non-human. In the wake of the bird's physical demise, her mind subtly reacts to the loss through persistent reminders of the canary via various associations. For example, that big nail to the right of the front door that once held the canary's cage becomes an enduring yet ambiguous symbol of the bird's presence. She admits, I can scarcely look at it even now and yet I could not bear to take it out. Illustrating her internal conflict between the desire to remove the nail, a simple piece of metal transformed into a significant memento, and the need to keep it. She averts her gaze from the nail to avoid confronting the notion of mortality, which plunges her into a profound sadness, yet she cannot bring herself to remove it, as it evokes the memory of her beloved pet. The nail, thus, remains on the wall, forever linking the ethereal presence of the canary to her, as her consciousness has already intertwined with the bird's eternal and timeless essence. Mansfield's personal experiences with illness profoundly influenced her literary work. One of her most renowned collections, The Garden Party and Other Stories, comprises 15 stories, with at least half addressing themes of illness, bereavement, or death. The theme of death is particularly pronounced in four stories. At the Bay, The Garden Party, the Daughters of the Late Colonel, and Life of Ma Parker. Mansfield employs the phenomenon of finitude to convey philosophical reflections on the interrelations between generations, social classes, and genders. In some stories, morbid themes are interwoven with comedic elements, while in others, Dialogue between generations serves as a vehicle to explore existential and societal issues. In At the Bay, young Kezia implores her grandmother to promise never to die. In The Garden Party, the death of a working-class man deeply disturbs young Laura, who attempts to convince her mother to cancel the garden party. However, upon seeing her reflection in a mirror, a recurring motif in Mansfield stories, Laura's perspective shifts. After the party, she brings food to the bereaved family, who gather around the deceased, reminiscent of an Edward Munch deathbed scene. This experience profoundly elevates Laura's mood, as if she has experienced a revelation. In The Daughters of the Late Colonel, the bereaved Pinner sisters are unable to accept their father's death, remaining imprisoned in their home, paralleling William Faulkner's arose for Emily. And bound by his judgmental views despite his passing. Their indecisiveness prevents them from seizing opportunities for freedom and independence. In Life of Ma Parker, the death of her grandson makes the kitchen maid recognize the relentless struggles of her life, which she realizes will continue. The Canary was written at the Hotel Chateau Bellevue in Sia, Switzerland, as a gift for Dorothy Brett, with whom Catherine Mansfield had briefly cohabited in Bloomsbury. This story, Mansfield's last completed work, was published posthumously in 1923. The initial inspiration for the narrative stemmed from her stay at the Victoria Palace Hotel in Paris, where she observed a woman across the street tending to caged canaries. 
The story features an elderly woman reflecting on the joy she once derived from her pet canary, now deceased. The bird possessed an especially beautiful song. Previously, the woman had focused her spiritual yearnings on the nightly appearance of Venus, the evening star, but she transferred these feelings to the canary upon acquiring it. She maintains a household with three male lodgers and regards the bird as a male companion. Aware of the disdain with which her lodgers view her, she nonetheless finds solace in the presence of the canary. Even during moments of existential threat, such as bad dreams and dark nights, she perceives the birds chirping as a comforting presence. Despite understanding that she should move beyond her loss, the death of the canary leaves her with an inexplicable emptiness and sadness. The canary epitomizes Mansfield's tendency towards static, non-dramatic storytelling, with minimal narrative development and an absence of dramatic events. The story is akin to a delicate character sketch that evokes an emotional state, characteristic of the modernist experiments Mansfield pursued alongside her contemporary and friend, Virginia Woolf. Like much of Mansfield's finest work, the story relies on understatement and subtle symbolism. The theme of an elderly woman finding comfort in a pet is a common motif, and Mansfield credibly portrays the pleasure and reassurance the woman derives from the bird's song. Simultaneously, the narrative alludes to the woman's half-formed yearnings, previously attached to the evening star, Venus. Venus, the Roman goddess associated with love, beauty, sex, fertility, prosperity, and desire, symbolizes elements that seem largely absent from the woman's life. This small vignette of domestic melancholy is further underscored by the woman's awareness that her lodgers refer to her as the scarecrow, though she reassures herself, it doesn't matter. Not in the least, nonetheless, without the bird in its cage, she experiences a profound, inchoate sense of loneliness and sadness that she cannot articulate or explain. The old woman's hesitancy and perspective are deftly mirrored in Mansfield's first-person narrative style. Each paragraph begins with an ellipsis, and the woman addresses an imaginary interlocutor. You see that big nail on the right of the front door? She strives to avoid give way to, to memories and so on, reflecting her struggle to cope with her loss. In conclusion, The Canary by Catherine Mansfield encapsulates core themes of deep ecology, such as recognizing the similarity and equality between human and non-human components of nature, and advocating for empathy rather than domination over other forms of life. Mansfield illustrates a human character's attainment of a broader sense of self. Aligning with Norwegian philosopher Arne Narys's concept of the wider self. By rooting her psychological state in the canary, a representative of non-human nature, and perceiving herself as intrinsically connected to it, the character achieves unity with her ecological self. She perceives no duality between herself and the non-human world, whether tangible or intangible, integrating nature as an essential part of her psyche. This process embodies a form of self-realization and a holistic perspective, consistent with deep ecology, which values all beings as interconnected elements of a unified ecosystem without hierarchical distinctions.